Three people are well known for their culpability in the 1986 nuclear disaster at Chernobyl. Only one is still alive today. This is his story. The story of the so-called madman of Chernobyl. It is a tragedy of poor circumstance, poor health, and a powerful cover-up whose life still exists in modern society. The name of this man is Nikolai Fomin, the chief engineer of Chernobyl. Nikolai Fomin's life faced many hardships equally due to his own character and the people around him. He started life in a simple place, born in a small village in the Donetsk Oblast on May 21, 1937. Fomin, as a child, found his village conquered by the Germans during the Patriotic War. Nevertheless, he ultimately survived, and when he fully matured, he pursued a career in electrical engineering. Fomin bounced from place to place, first working as a serviceman for the Poltava power grid, and then assisting in the construction at the Zaporizhia Thermal Power Plant, a coal-fired site that had only just been commissioned the year he left for Chernobyl. At the end of 1972, Brokhanov personally nominated Nikolai Fomin as the chief of the electrical unit, and from there he rapidly rose through the ranks, favoured by Brokhanov and the Communist Party in Kiev. In 1982, as the resignations and the firings swept through the staff at the nuclear power plant following the partial meltdown of Unit 1, Fomin had reached the pinnacle of his career, the position of chief engineer. Fomin stood in complete contrast to Brokhanov. Where Brokhanov was relatively popular and had many friends, Fomin was harsh and envious of others. In one situation, a colleague, Lev Lauknin, purchased a car and Fomin felt desperate to purchase one of his own. The two workers travelled to Kiev, where Fomin chose his own vehicle and had Laukanin drive it back to him and park it in a garage. It was March, there was still snow on the ground and Laukanin warned him to keep his car in the garage, lest he drive it and lose control in the icy conditions. This did not stop Fomin, and a week later Laukanin heard from a colleague that Fomin had taken the car and driven it straight into a birch tree. Later in 1985, Fomin had a similar accident. Driving his car to his dacha outside of Pripyat, Fomin became distracted at the wheel, losing control and causing it to flip as it fell off the road. The ensuing crash caused him severe damage to his coccyx, leaving him effectively paralysed. When he had finally recuperated and returned to work in February of 1986, his subordinates found that his personality was still the same person they knew from before the accident. A precise, demanding and impulsive person, whose voice would raise whenever he grew excited about the subject. In his eyes, Chernobyl was a prestigious place to work, and he thrust himself into understanding it, even if he lacked the qualifications in nuclear engineering. Outwardly, however, Fomin was a physical shell of his former self, his erratic movements now slowed and constantly showing the pain he felt from walking. As chief engineer, Fomin had to approve the turbine rundown program, which he had already approved multiple times in the past year without incident. As such, he signed it off and allowed for all the necessary preparation to take place. As a matter of fact, the turbine rundown program was low on his list of concerns for Unit 4. The top priority was fixing the turbines, the ones installed in Units 3 and 4 were more modern, with less metal. However, this had made them highly sensitive to changes in operation, resulting in vibrations that threatened to destroy them. So, on April 7th, Fomin sent a letter to the Kharkiv turbine plant, asking them to attend the shutdown to record vibrations on both turbines, to pinpoint the error and allow them to correct it. In the weeks leading up to the disaster, Fomin's time was gradually lost to managing the small accidents that occasionally occurred, organising the smooth operation of affected systems while handling the logistics of the repairs, delegating the other tasks to the Deputy Chief Engineer for Science, Mikhail Yutov, and the Nuclear Safety Department. He, too, had to battle other major plans for the future of the nuclear power plant, in charge of organising major administrative changes to the running of the nuclear power plant, and preparing plans that would see Unix 5 and 6, under construction at the time, converted into an entirely separate nuclear power plant with its own management. And so, we arrive on April the 25th, 1986, the day that the turbine rundown program was set to commence. Fomin's day began early, around 4.50am, with a phone call from Alexander Akimov, asking for permission to raise more control rods to keep the reactor power of the Unit 4 stable. Fomin approved, and he began to get ready for another shift at the nuclear power plant. At 6.30am, 
Fomin called the Chief Shift Supervisor, Boris Rogozhkin, to ask for an update on all of the reactors before he set off to the nuclear power plant himself. Rogozhkin obliged, but he never gave an update on Unit 4. Fomin was satisfied with Akimov's report, and he doubted Rogozhkin would have much to add. At the nuclear power plant, Fomin would attend the daily briefing, listening to the obligatory update on the status of all four nuclear reactors. Once it was done, he resumed work. Aside from the shutdown of Unit 4, it was an otherwise normal day. And why would he be concerned? Igor Kazachkov and Anatoly Dyatlov were at the helm of Unit 4. Nothing could go wrong. At the end of his shift, having heard nothing about the turbine rundown or the shutdown, he called Unit 4 and found out the next shift, headed by Yuri Tregub, was still working. The reactor had not been shut down. When Fomin asked why, Yuri Tregov explained that the shutdown had been postponed by an incident at the South Ukraine nuclear power plant, and they were waiting for Dyatlov. Satisfied, Fomin ended the call and went home. Nikolai Fomin's night was uneventful, and he retired to his bed in his apartment in Pripyat, unaware of anything out of the ordinary. Someone was calling his apartment. He answered the call. The chief shift supervisor, Boris Rogozhkin, was calling from the nuclear power plant. An accident had occurred at Unit 4, and his presence was urgently required. For an unknown reason, the call summoning all members of the nuclear power plant administration to the nuclear power plant had not been sent to Fomin's apartment. Nevertheless, he got changed and made his way outside. He flagged down a bus and started his way to Chernobyl. The bus ride was naturally not without difficulty. The driver was afraid to leave Pripyat, fearful of radiation, but Fomin forced him to. As soon as they left Pripyat, armed militia also stopped the bus, distributing iodine pills. When it seemed like they were to be turned around, Fomin merely showed his pass and the bus was allowed out of the city to the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. When he arrived, Fomin followed what he had been ordered to do in numerous drills make his way to the bunker under the main administration building and coordinate the response from there. Due to the breakdown of information making its way from Unit 4, however, this amounted to Fomin merely sitting and waiting for any information, agitated but otherwise useless. Fomin remained in this state for hours, occasionally leaving the bunker to look at Unit 4 from a distance. Around 10am, Fomin was on one of these inspections when he saw a massive plume of smoke eject from Unit 4 and the volume of smoke increased rapidly. When he contacted Unit 4 to find out what they had done, he had learned that they severed the water supply due to a lack of water. Fomin remained in this paralysed state, unable to help and alternating between highs of excitement and eagerness to exist, and lows of deep depression and even sopping. When Nikolai Karpan, Deputy Chief of the Nuclear Safety Department, eventually found him, he brought even worse news. The reactor appeared to be about to go critical again. The depressed state that this fact left him in was held for hours, even as more members of the government commission arrived and began to press Fomin on the facts. Even through the worst facts, such as radioactive water flooding the lower levels of Unit 4 and 3, as well as the cable rooms that connected to Units 1 and 2, Fomin insisted that this was in fact a good thing, as it meant that the reactor fuel was likely submerged and therefore unlikely to begin melting. Eventually, at 4pm, Fomin would convey to them all in a meeting at the city's Communist Party headquarters that he believed that the reactor was destroyed and started to offer any scientific advice and aid he could. It was at this point that Brikhanov and Fomin were effectively relieved of all duties at the nuclear power plant, lacking the resources and authority to manage the cleanup of Reactor 4. The two would remain in the bunker under the main administration building following the evacuation, Fomin sleeping at night in an adjacent room, following every order to commanded on the telephone by the government commission, until they were evacuated to the Skaznochki, or fairy tale summer camp. Fomin would remain at the nuclear power plant for only a few weeks after the accident, before being sent away to rest and recuperate when his mental health gave out. He was still recuperating on July 14th, when the Politburo voted to hold him and others accountable for the accident, by tolerating rule-breaking and accused criminal negligence at the nuclear power plant. In a party meeting in Kiev, Fomin was ejected from the Communist Party of the Soviet Union for approving the turbine rundown program, a program that had been reproduced multiple times. Fomin was charged with breaking Article 220, Paragraph 2, and Article 165 of Ukrainian law, 
a breach of safety regulations at an explosion prone plant or facility and abuse of power respectively. Interesting, given that RBMKs and other nuclear power plants should not be considered explosion prone facilities or plants. The scheduled trial in March of 1987 had to be delayed due to Fomin's ill health, which will not be covered due to the sensitivity of the subject. More details can be found in other books and documentaries. Regardless, on July 7, 1987, the trial began. Fomin pleaded not guilty to Article 220, but guilty to the lesser Article 165, which carried a sentence of five years in prison. Let us have a look at Fomin's court testimony. Fomin. Witness M. Umanitz testified that the program, if conducted in compliance with the regulations, would ensure the safety of the reactor. The accident was caused by deviations from the program, in the power level, in the low operational reactivity margin, in disabled safety systems. Due to a poor training of the senior reactor control engineer, the reactor's power had fallen to zero. Judge Raymond Bryce. Why had you approved the program you yourself considered wrong? Fomin. In 1982, 1984, and 1985, in the course of conducting the program, the reactor's AZ-5 was activated by a signal closure of the turbine steam supply valve. But in 1986, changes were introduced in this connection. Now, it is clear for me that the program should have been agreed with all specialists. There was no need to maintain a power level of the apparatus if steam supply to all turbo generators was cut off. Prosecutor Yuri Shadvin. Why did you not comply with the schedule of workplace rounds and review of operational documentation? Fomin. I made my last inspection rounds regularly, but I did not register them. Shadrin. The last entry is dated 18th of March 1985. Was it your last inspection round? Fomin. I returned to work in late February of 1986. I operated in the office as walking was accompanied by pain. Doctors recommended me to stay home, but I returned to my duties for the sake of work. Shadwin. Did Bukhanov know that the program would be run? Fomin. He says that he did not know. Shadwin. Did you tell him about that? Fomin. No, I did not tell him. Shadwin. As you think, what could have prevented the accident? Fomin. Had not AZ-5 on closure of emergency regulating valves been disabled, the unit would have remained intact. Shadwin. Well, but why then is the program silent about that? Why didn't the safety section specify that it is prohibited to do such things? Where are the Utah and physicists in the program? Why are only electrical engineers referred to here? Fomin remains silent. Shadwin. Who, do you think, is the key causer of the accident? Fomin. Dyatlov and Erkimov, who deviated from the program. Unknown physicist. All the experiments failed, but you nevertheless signed the technical solution of October 31st, 1985 on commissioning of the rundown unit. Fomin. We just needed to check the period of time of operation of the feed water pumps by rundown power. Physicist. Why then had you disabled the technological safety systems? Fomin. It is difficult to say. Several versions may be suggested. Physicist, as you think, why was the reactor power reduced to 200 megawatts instead of 700? Fomin, I think that the personnel intuitively assumed that a lower power is safer. Fomin's defender, why did you return to work before you completed recovery? Fomin, the director was to attend the 27th Communist Party of the Soviet Union Congress, and the party committee secretary Parishin asked me to return to work. I objected but he said that I would not need to deal with the operational issues and I relented. Unknown physicist. Having only a correspondence course in physics, what did you hope for when you fulfilled the duties of the nuclear power plant chief engineer? For me, I did not seek to take the chief engineer's position, but when I was offered it, I did not refuse. Besides that, I recommended to the director to appoint physicists as deputy chief engineers. Sitnikov, Dyatlov and Lyutov are all physicists. Shadrin. Defendant Fomin. Yesterday, we had a detailed discussion on deviations from the safety rules in the program itself and in its execution. How could you, as chief engineer, explain these deviations? Fomin. The program was designed to make the test representative. 
Shadrin, the question deals with other matters. How could your deputy Dyatlov allow the deviations that resulted in the accident? Fomin, Dyatlov is an experienced specialist. He had nine years of practical experience at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, and he knows his duties well. I knew Akimov as a professional, careful specialist. I observed his work when I was a deputy chief engineer. Senior reactor control engineer Tottenov was not very experienced. He did not have the skills for operating in transient modes. Shadrin, you do not answer to the point. How could you explain deviations from the safety rules made by your personnel? Fomin, without having the testimony of Akimov, I think that it was mainly due to deputy chief engineer Dyatlov's costiveness. Fomin, by the end of the trial, had accepted blame and pleaded for mercy, a lighter sentence. He would have to wait until July 29th to find out his final sentence. Guilty, of course, with 10 years in prison. Fomin wept at the dock while his colleagues remained steadfast. Nikolai Fomin's mental health never fully recovered from the accident. In 1988, he was diagnosed with reactive psychosis and transferred to a psychiatric hospital until 1990, where he was released due to prolonged mental health issues. He eventually found work at the Kalinin nuclear power plant until retirement. Even then, his mental health was still poor. In 2000, Nikolai Fomin removed to Odomilia in the Tvi region. Despite his insistence to his wife that they try and live life anew and forget about the past, they never could. Fomin lived with his wife and children, as well as a cat, until his wife passed away. Now he lives alone, with few friends at the age of 86. Fomin's life is a tale of sadness, of struggling to overcome health challenges both physically and mentally, only to be defeated by unfortunate circumstances. It is a fate that many people feel like they are going through. And therefore, I feel it is important to stress that when life feels difficult, reach out to people for help and vice versa. Help people who are struggling. Everyone can do with help in time. As for Filmin, however, he will remain as the last surviving member of the main three accused of the accident. The last person alive who knows of the desperate struggle to contain the accident in the initial hours after the explosion and unable to share it due to his isolation. I wish Filmin good health. <laughs>